Welcome to Radiant Church. My name is Andrew. I'm the lead pastor. And we're so glad you could join us today from wherever you're watching or listening from. If it's your first time joining us, hey, go to RadiantChurchSC.com and click I'm new. If you fill out that short form online for us as a way of saying thanks, we're going to donate $5 to one of the nonprofits that's listed. Well, we're in our second week of a six-week study in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And each week, we're going to break down a passage uh, from a chapter in his letter. Now, during the week, the other six days, we're encouraging you to read through that particular week's chapter and record questions and observations and applications from what you're reading in your reading journal. So you can download the Ephesian reading journal by visiting our website, clicking the download link on any message in this series, okay? So last week, we dealt with the end of chapter 1, specifically Paul's prayer for the Ephesian Christians in chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. But today, we're going to focus on what's really the crux of the entire higher letter. So one of the major themes in this letter to the Ephesians is love. And you cannot have love in the body of Christ if there's not unity, which espouses a love for each other. So there isn't a whole lot of unity in our world right now, at least not here in, in America. Uh, some recent polling data actually suggested, actually showed that for the first time since the civil rights movement, the majority of black and white Americans have a distrust for one another. Uh, and it's not just a race issue. I think we could look at it as politics as well. Republicans and Democrats are fiercely opposed to each other. Some even see the other side as domestic enemies of the state, as one individual said. Uh, we have divisions along gender and sexual and economic, philosophical lines, a whole host of, of other issues as well. But one division I'm really concerned about, it's been forming within the church here in America. And, and it's not recent. I mean, it might feel that way, uh, but it's actually been progressively building for a while now. But it has really begun to show itself in the last two to three years. So many of the socioeconomic divisions that we see in our nation are really spilling over into the church. And, and I've had several conversations with pastors who see a divide happening in their own congregations along these lines. And if there was ever a time, I think, for the church to hear the words that Paul writes in a Ephesians chapter 2, it is today. Uh, Paul's focus on unity. It's going to take us to chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. And we're going to break down that passage into three sections in a moment. But first, let's read what Paul has to say to the Ephesians living in the first century. Chapter 2, verse number 11. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were once called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises that God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. What a statement that is. But now you've been united with Christ. And once you were far away from God, but now you've been brought near to Him through the blood of Jesus. Look at verse number 14. For Christ Himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. When in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. And he did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from two different groups. So together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility toward each other was put to death. Verse number 17, he brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were once far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. And so now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. Verse number 19, so now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. That's a key statement. We'll come back to that at the end. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You're members of God's family. And together we're his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. And through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. 
And we can take this passage, we can break it down into three different sections which build upon the unity that Paul longs for Christians to have with each other. So what exactly does Paul want his readers to know about unity? Well, first, he wants them to know that Jesus unites us with God. That Jesus unites us with God. Look at verse number 11 again one more time. You know, in, in, in those verses, 11, 12, and 13, he's going to start off by reminding the Ephesians who they once were. This is important because I think the longer we serve Christ, the, the greater the danger of becoming complacent, the greater the danger of forgetting who you once were and, and who you used to be before you met Jesus. And so the Ephesian Christians were mostly Greek. They weren't Jewish. And, and there was a major division between non-Jewish or, or Gentile, we might say, Christians and Jewish Christians within the early days of the church in the first century. So the Jewish believers felt that every man had to undergo the physical act of circumcision to receive God's promises. That was a painful thing, right? Circumcision was the physical symbol that you were a recipient of God's favor and blessing and part of His people. So the thought among the Jewish Christians was, if you're not circumcised, you didn't receive any privileges or favor from God at all. Now remember this, because it forms the key to Paul's teaching in the next section we're going to see in a few minutes. So Paul reminds the Gentile Christians guys who aren't Jewish, and they were who they were before Christ. They were isolated and distant from God. It really forms, I think, the bridge to the first ten verses in the chapter where Paul mentions all of humanity is without Christ. We're all lost in sin, and we're distant from God. And then he tells them in verse number 12, hey, they lived in the world without God and without hope. It's a crazy, bold statement, right? I, I would encourage you to go back. Last week, we talked a lot about hope. Listen to that message uh, about Christ being our hope. Because without Him, man, we're, we're, there is no hope. And, and Paul's right. But how are we united with God? How are we brought close to Him? Well, how do we receive the, the hope, right, that Jesus brings to us? Well, we can't get to God on our own merit. We, we can't buy our way in. And Paul makes it really clear in verse 13 that we were far away from God. We've been brought near now to Him through the blood of Christ. This isn't just a random use of words here. I think Paul, he's one of the most intelligent men to ever live. And he has in mind here several Old Testament passages that use the phrase brought near to him, referencing God. Many of these passages, are you'll find them in Isaiah and the Psalms, Genesis, and they use those words, you know, near and far to describe a day when Gentiles in mass will worship God. And it's a secondary thought. Israel was the primary concern in the Old Testament, right? But Gentiles are secondary. But now because of Christ and the sacrifice that's happened, God's brought Gentiles into the picture. They're no longer a secondary thought. They're now primary with Israel in God's eyes. There was kind of this element of, of almost, you know, second-class citizen treatment that Gentiles received from Jews. But Paul's writing here refutes that idea. And, and, and we're now united with God because of what Christ did for us on the cross. Because of the empty tomb. In God's view, we're all one. There's no Jew or Greek or slave or free or male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus, as Paul says in an earlier letter to the Galatians. We're all one in Christ. But just because God sees us as one, it doesn't mean we see each other that way. And that leads to the second section in verses 14 through 18 that Paul wants his readers to know next. That Jesus unites us with each other. He unites us with each other. From the very beginning, Paul states in verse 14 that Jesus has brought peace to us, us being, you know, the body of Christ here. And I think it's really important to understand what kind of peace we're talking about. It's not the absence of conflict. It's actually shalom. So shalom is holistic peace. It's living your life in the way that God intended it to be lived or, you know, as the way things should be. Okay? It's the idea that peace is both vertical and horizontal. So it's, it's vertical in that we have a holistic peace with God, and it's horizontal in that Christ brings holistic peace with each other. So remember how you know, the Jews and Gentiles were, were different, how the Gentiles at times were viewed as second class almost. Well, Paul brings this imagery of a wall or barrier between the two groups in verses 14 and 15. And it's not a metaphorical wall that he's thinking about. It's an actual, literal wall. He's thinking about the temple here. So the temple had a physical division between Gentile worshipers and Jewish worshipers. The court of the the Gentiles was the outermost court of the temple, and anybody could come worship God there. But to get inside that temple, you had to set foot in the court 
of the Israelites, and only the Jews could do that. So you couldn't actually enter as a proselyte. You had to be an ethnic Jew to do it. And signs are posted in Greek and Latin, warning any Gentile who entered the court of the Israelites that they could be executed for doing so. So when Paul is writing this letter, he's, he's doing it while he's under house arrest in Rome. How did he get here? Well, it actually starts in Acts 21, and he was accused of bringing a Gentile, a Gentile Christian named Trophias, into the court of the Israelites. And I'm sure this is fresh on his mind as he's writing about the division between the two groups. And it leads him to state in verse number 15 that Jesus has done something quite remarkable. That in his death and resurrection, he's taken two people groups and he's formed one new people. Again, Galatians 3 comes to mind. No Jew, no Greek, that kind of thing, right? We're all one in Christ. He's so adamant about unity that he makes a statement which almost sounds like he's advocating that Jesus and the Old Testament law with its commands and regulations. You read that in verse number 15. But what Paul is actually arguing for is the end of using Scripture as a means to exclude Gentile or non-Jewish Christians. How many times have Christians used God's Word, incorrectly so, to exclude or even oppress other people groups, including other Christians in those groups? It's, it's happened before, and I'm telling you right now, it is happening again. We're, we're never to use God's word to strike division among his people. Christ didn't die for division. He died and rose for unity. Like we're one new people, white, black, men, women, old, young, American, immigrant, Democrat, Republican, rich, poor. We're all one in Christ. And this new people is reconciled to God because of Jesus' death, as, as 16 explains, right? Verse 16. But, and, and don't miss this here, the hostility we might have toward each other, that's put to death too because of what Christ did, Paul says. So Christ's death and resurrection is both constructive and destructive. It destroys the hostility between us as believers and Christians, removing our divisions and prejudices towards each other, and it constructs an entirely new people. And so now when we're, you know, in the body of Christ, we're not just reconciled and united with God, we're also reconciled and united with each other. It's why the body of Christ has been and will continue to be the most diverse group of people on on the planet. How can so many people who are so different be united? How can the world around us, you know, cave everywhere but the church still stand? It's not because we have great ideas or better systems or enlightened thinking. It's because Jesus has destroyed our old selves with our old ideas, our old systems and sin, and he's constructed a new people who are one in mind and body and spirit with him and each other. Unity is mentioned four times alone in this passage, and I don't think that's an accident. People haven't changed much from the first century, you know? Paul needs the Ephesian Christians to understand how important it is to think of yourself as a member of the body of Christ first, be a Jew second, be an Ephesian second. We might say it today like this, that I'm a member of the body of Christ first, and I'm an American second. Or I'm a member of the body of Christ first, and I'm white second, or black second, Hispanic, Asian second. What does all this unifying get us? Well, verse 18 holds the key. Reconciliation and unity gives us access, the privilege to enter God's presence. There's no wall separating us. There is no, you worship out here, we'll worship in here. No, we're all invited to worship the Lord together. And that leads us right to the third and final section in verses 19 through 22, where Paul wants the Ephesians to know that Jesus dwells in a united church. It's really important to understand with all the talk about unity that Paul was not advocating the Gentile Christians replace the nation of Israel in verse number 19. Rather, Gentile Christians share with the people of Israel the privileges of being God's people, that we're now citizens of God's kingdom and we're no longer foreigners. The word foreigner that Paul uses, it refers to a temporary status. It was someone who had no rights in the nation in which they were residing. So when Paul says to the Ephesians, you're no longer foreigners, he means they have full rights and privileges of being citizens in God's kingdom. Jew or Greek, black or white, educated or not, rich or poor, we're all given the same access and the same rights in God's kingdom as followers of Jesus. Now he ventures off 
in the last few verses, verses 20 through 22, to close the chapter by explaining how a united body of Christ forms the house of God where the Holy Spirit dwells. You'll notice this house is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets in verse number 20. He's not referring to Old Testament prophets. He's actually talking about those who operate in the office of prophet in the New Testament. And by prophet, we don't mean someone foretelling the future necessarily. The prophetic word was the word that was preached in a corporate gathering, which is what I'm doing right now to you online, okay? The foundation the church is built on is the apostles, the eyewitnesses to Jesus, which included others like Paul who saw the resurrected Jesus. And the prophets built up and encouraged and comforted each other with their divine revelation, which in other words would be preaching. So what makes the foundation possible? Well, it's Jesus who's the chief cornerstone, as Paul says in verse number 20. That word cornerstone, it appears only in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, something called the Septuagint, and it only appears so in Isaiah 28, verse 16, where it's referred to as the foundation stone. And these foundation stones were determined along the lines of the building. One of the foundation stones excavated was 570 tons. It's huge. They're heavy. But this stone tested every other stone that was laid. It tested every crossbeam which was erected. It was the source of which every angle was drawn out. This cornerstone was the standard of measurement for which the entire building architecturally, constructively was measured. And so what Paul was getting at here is that the church must be in conformity with the chief cornerstone, that is Jesus. He's the one by which everything is measured and is only possible because of the person and work of Christ. And so God's people are are now God's temple. And ironically enough, the ones who were kept out of the physical temple are included in creating this new indwelling where God comes with his Holy Spirit. He dwells today in the United Church. And so you say, Pastor, okay, I hear all of this, but what about all the divisions right now? Well, remember, love was a major theme in Ephesians, and so is unity. Could have easily called this teaching series, you know, together, because the idea of being together is so pervasive in this letter. It's all over the place. I I know there's mountains of division right now in our world. I'm not naive enough to think that some of those divisions are not destructive to who we are as a nation, who we are as a, as a church from a you know, global church, big C kind of perspective. Our culture wants to define unity as you agree with me, do what I say, and we can work together. And if you can't, well, you're the enemy. And everyone does this. <laughs> Everybody on every side. I was thinking about the Berlin Wall and putting together the, the, the message here. And you know, when the Berlin Wall fell, two different Germanys existed. In the West, there was, there was freedom and free markets and freedom of expression and thought. There were wealthy and middle class and, and poor people. There was education and artistic expression. But in the East, there was hopelessness. There was immense poverty. Many of the people were not educated. Authoritarian rule from a socialist type government dominated every facet of life. And in the bringing together of two different people groups, There was certainly excitement and joy and profound love, but man, it was hard. I mean, the part of history nobody outside of Germany remembers is how hard unity was. Germany struggled throughout much of the 90s, economically, socially, politically, culturally, as unity was being woven into the fabric of society. But in the end, they came out stronger for it. When the body of Christ, unity is not a walk in the park, It's, it's hard. It's not easy living in unity with God because you're a constant target for the enemy. Spiritual attacks can sometimes be rampant. You're trying to avoid snares and traps, and sometimes your old life it just looks more enticing, and you're tempted to go back. But then you remember who you were and who you are now. The East Germans would never go back to the life they left. A united Germany was so much better. In a life in Christ with God, we're reunited. It's far better than who I used to be. I'm I'm not going back. You got to make the decision to stay the course. 
But it's a struggle to be united with each other too. What I see happening among the church in America right now are just fissures and fractures. We're drawing dividing lines based on race. We're drawing them based on politics. We're, we're putting our own demographics and labels ahead instead of insisting that, you know what, those aren't our people. Our people are those in the body of Christ, right? You know, the, the people in the kingdom of God, united together as one. So show grace, show love, show forgiveness, and yes, show tolerance. Tolerate political differences. Tolerate racial differences. Tolerate economic differences. Don't let those things divide you. Remember who you are in Christ and how you're united with God and each other and how God's spirit dwells, not in a fractured church, but it dwells in a united church. May Paul's writing in this passage speak deeply to us and be at the forefront of our hearts and our minds in Christ. And may we, as the body of Jesus, be united. Let's pray together. Father, I love you. Thank you for your goodness and grace and your majesty. Lord, I pray for unity right now in the body of Christ. I pray that we are united, uh, Father, and that we are one. I mean, may we not let politics and race and all the different things that we could uh, seep in to divide us in the kingdom of God. May we firmly stand united in who we are, rich and poor and black and white, men and women, God, coming together, being united in spirit with each other. Lord, we, we know a house divided can't stand. May we take these words from Paul to heart and be united in who we are in the kingdom of God to reach and win people, God, for you all around this world. Lord, I pray here today for those who may not be united with you yet. In fact, if that's you here, uh, I, I want to encourage you to pray along with me, a simple prayer. You want to be united with God? It's a simple prayer you can pray with me that goes just like this. Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. Forgive me for the wrong that I've done. I'm tired of doing things my way. I need you to save me from myself. Cleanse me of my sin. Cleanse me of my wrong. And become Lord of my life. Guide me and direct me. May your will be done. I don't want to call the shots anymore. You take control. I surrender my life over to you. I want to be united as one with you here today. You said that prayer, that you're part of the kingdom of God, and we celebrate that here today, and congratulations. And Lord, I, I thank you for those who said that. They're now united with you. God, I pray for those Christians who struggle today with unity. We've been praying about the church being one, talking about the church being one, but there are those believers who still struggle. They, they can't get past race. They can't get past politics. They can't get past ideology and, and economics and all the different types of things that are out. Lord, I pray that you will deconstruct our worldly prisms and perspectives of how to view people and God you would restruct or, or build in our lives a godly perspective and prism for which we see people as you see them from from God from which we interact with people God as, as as you would interact with them Lord and that we see others in the body of Christ as brothers and sisters that we are united together as one one people with one purpose to serve and worship you Lord, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that your spirit unites us. I thank you your spirit unites us with you and with each other. And I thank you that you dwell within a united church. In a world that's dividing and falling apart, may we not fracture. May we stand strong. May we be united, God, and be a force for all that is good and holy for you and your kingdom in this world, we pray. Amen. Hey, if you said that prayer with us here today uh, to accept Christ and be united with the Lord, and you're part of God's kingdom, you're in, and uh, that's exciting. Congratulations. We want to help you with your next steps. Contact us. Let us know. Office at Radiant. Uh, churchsc.com. Let us know you said yes, and we'd love to help you with what those next steps are. If Radiant Church has impacted you in any way, hey, we want to hear from you. Go to our website and click share your story. Let us know how we have been a part of uh, impacting your life as you grow in your walk with the Lord. We are excited uh, for the remainder of this teaching series. Man, this is chapter two. We still got three, four, five, and six coming up here. It's going to be a good one. Have an incredible rest of your day wherever you are and we'll see you again next time.